Thank you very much. It's an honor and pleasure to welcome Katja Holbitz from Guerrilla Girls with us, as well as Christoph Oditzko. I think it's always important, I mean, you came to hear the artists speak, and I think it's always good to let them speak uh, without questions first, so I uh, want to give each of them the chance to speak for five minutes and to show slides, and then we'll go on with questions, start the discussion, and hopefully we're gonna have time for one or two questions in the end from the public. Katek, please. Okay. okay, back to the 80s. Imagine you were a young female artist in the 1980s, pissed off about the lack of opportunities for women and people of color in the art world and beyond. Imagine you went to a protest outside the Museum of Modern Art after it opened a survey of contemporary art that included only 14 women out of around 168 artists. Not one person cared. That was your aha moment. You realized that there had to be a better way, a more contemporary, creative, in your face way, to break through people's belief that museums knew best and there was no discrimination in art. Imagine you had a new idea about how to construct political art, to twist an issue around and present it in a way, in an unforgettable way, hopefully, that hadn't been seen before. Imagine you had a meeting, named yourselves Guerrilla Girls, and passed the hat around to pay for printing those posters. You snuck around New York in the middle of the night, pasting up those game-changing posters, and all hell broke loose. Those first posters led to countless more, plus billboards, street actions, videos, workshops, performances, books, not just about discrimination in art. And here are some early posters, very early posters, and then our most well-known, probably, poster. And then I had to put this one in because it actually disses the Hirshhorn, done in about two <laughs> <laughs> You'll see in a minute, if you can read the bottom, this, it has statistics for the museums on the mall. This is about 2007, I believe, that we did that one. So in art, not just about art, but also in pop culture, in film, and in politics. I'm sorry, you didn't get to see much of that. But here's a good one for you. Yeah, unfortunately, this has come true. Our work has become a model for people all over the world, aged about eight to 80, who write us all the time telling us they're doing their own crazy, creative kind of complaining, and they use us as a model for it, which is a wonderful thing. These days, you might find us in Istanbul, Bologna, Brazil, doing museum intervention, interventions in places like Minneapolis, um, the Walker in Minneapolis, um, Whitechapel Gallery in London, and running a complaints department at Tate Modern. <laughs> or doing a, and by the way, the complaints department needs to be on the mall, I think, for sure. Um, or doing a street campaign in New York about income inequality and billionaires controlling art. So the world of artists is great, but the art world sucks. The super rich are controlling the museums, sitting on the boards. Power is being centralized into these few rich people. Like it's really about the 1%. But unfortunately, the art world right now appears to be about money and about the production of luxury items. Billionaires are making more and more and more, and their taste controls which artists get the big bucks and get the opportunities and get the shows. We're planning to sneak around New York with the Illuminator, so we'll be starting out in Chelsea, and we hope to then go to the Whitney. So we had this idea to do something we could do really fast around New York, 
and put these stickers up. Some of the stickers are about art galleries, about billionaires, billionaire collectors, and about museums. So we wanted to put them up where they belong, on the big galleries, on the museums, and give them out to people, especially so they could do the same thing. And it seemed like a great idea. Call people together, just put the word out, see who comes, and just run around the streets and put these things up and bother people. It's gonna be a Saturday in Chelsea. People walking around, feeling really good about having seen all this inspiring art, and all of a sudden, they're gonna see the wall above start talking to them. And it's gonna say, Dear Art Collector. We completely get it. Collecting art is so expensive. We really understand why you can't afford to pay all your employees a living wage. The wall is gonna to talk to them. Every time we put something up, you know, people would go bananas. Some people would love it, some people would hate it. So we would sort of work in that space. It's really very productive to provoke people to think about things. And we discovered early on that if you could make someone who disagreed with you laugh, you know, you had a hook inside their brain. You know, once you were in there, you just might be able to change their minds about things. Okay, so um, the Gorilla Girls have had over 55 members over our 33 years, some for weeks, some for decades. We've been diverse in age, sexual orientation, class, and from many ethnic backgrounds, South Asian, Asian, African American, Latinx, European, etc. We've had um, cis and trans members from the beginning. And we've always believed in an intersectional feminism that fights for all human rights. But our group works the way artists have always worked, exploring issues and seeing what we can come up with that might have the power to change people's minds. Humor helps us do that. And our motto is basically, speak up if it works, speak up more. And if it doesn't, speak up more anyway. And it all began with the very first two posters we put up in 1985 that are in brand new at the Hershel. Thank you very much. So Christoph, thank you in advance for giving a short introduction to your work. Well, this, uh, I would like to focus on two projects. Uh, they are presented one inside of the museum and one on the facade of the museum with some context. Uh, this is the slide from my window. Uh, that was to, uh, to, 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 to just an evidence how quickly the city was uh, uh, transformed. The uneven development was called. So some buildings were built, people were evicted. There was 100,000 of homeless people in uh, New York City 30 years ago. So you could see, of course, that many of those people are surviving in various ways. There was a certain group of them who were more visible. There were the people who were uh, healthy enough and strong enough to be able to sustain themselves by reselling uh, picked up bottles from can, plastic, and metal. And they were using those uh, uh, shopping carts. So the perception was, of course, that they were so-called borrowing some vehicles, if not stealing them, in order to uh, operate and uh, as uh, if they were, they were scavengers who were uh, faceless uh, characters with whom we had no uh, contact. 
So my idea was, next slide please, to, uh, to come up with something that will be in between homeless and non-homeless people. Some kind of artifice that will operate a little bit like a shock absorbing mechanism, at the same time articulating conditions through design, the conditions of their life, uh, conditions that should not exist in civilized world. Uh, those are the early sketches of such uh, vehicles that are discussed with homeless people in depth, and they all rejected those slides, those projects, as insufficient. First of all, because those projects were about minimum shelter uh, and kind of privacy, when they were saying, no, it's not an issue of privacy, it's about security. We have to be visible. We have to really be legitimate. We have to have equipment that will be seen as legitimate, uh, ourselves as legitimate members of urban community who work day and night for which they, we should be paid, in fact, and we contribute to the economy of the city. So that this legitimation of conditions at the same time, I thought, should create a situation in which people will realize this is not really how it should be. 100 thousand homeless people uh, on vehicles taking over the city. This kind of uh, uh, image was to be rejected. Next slide, please. So uh, here there was this version that uh, came out of consultation uh, with homeless people who advised me about so many different needs that the vehicle designed according to this started to collapse under the weight of its functional program. It actually was almost impossible to carry all this. At the same time, I did try to carry it, to actually transport the visibility of those needs, conditions of life, through various social strata of the city, sections of the city, to cause a risk reaction. So the vehicle actually uh, provoked lots of conversations. Uh, most of those were rejecting this vehicle. It was impossible. Before the rejection, there was lots of understanding why this section was made, what is the function of this part, why are you actually using it this way, and eventually, who, who are you? What's your name? How it happened that you became homeless? This kind of uh, vehicle became a converging point of many, many questions and inquiries. So it became discursive machine. Next slide, please. So of course it was for walking. Next slide. So this vehicle, uh, especially this one, is it's an, an evidence that somehow the project is still relevant. Now I'd like to show a little bit of the video. So you could see how this vehicle operated as uh, a as an instrument for performance, for instruction, for communication, for a discussion. Next slide, please. So of course, other projects evolve out of this. Please show them very quickly, but you can see that the next generation of vehicles were now uh, uh, compensated for the lack of uh, of communication uh, uh, program. This is a, a, a request from Jenny to show some of my projects from 1970s, uh, just so to uh, maybe entertain some of the conversation afterwards about the difference between, uh, between uh, my work in 70s in Poland <laughs> and present and a vehicle from 30 years ago. To move on to the projection work. Yes. So there might be some questions about this I will answer uh, during our discussion. <laughs> But this is a very different metaphoric machine that responded to the condition of intelli artistic intelligentsia <laughs> of that time in, in, a, in a kind of uh, uh, situation of state socialism, which was more of a, a progression machine. Next slide, please. 
So I'd like to refer here to a uh, uh, very important part of uh, uh, George Bush. Uh, during uh, the final weeks of his electoral campaign, he was referring to this uh, thousands of points of light. Next. A man who sees life in terms of missions, missions defined and missions completed. I will not allow this country to be made weak again. I will keep America moving forward, always forward, for an endless, enduring dream and a thousand points of light. This is my mission, and I will complete it. So those are the slides that you will be seeing on the facade. On one hand, one slide, on another hand, another slide, and then there's uh, below a series uh, of rows of microphones. So on one hand, uh, uh, four uh, uh, death sentence, on the other hand, uh, against abortion. On one hand, uh, uh, against uh, pro-death, on the other hand, pro-life. This kind of contradiction of the electoral pla uh, uh, platform or the ideological contradiction of this, of this rhetorics of that time, I thought it was an inspiration for me. An incredible role of media and uh, also the form of the building, which seemed to be asking for those slides, especially uh, the open mouth of the building. <laughs> that seem to be uh, facing, uh, of course, uh, a nas uh, national mall, uh, ready to say something. So just to complete this uh, facade, I decided to create this kind of arrangement of slides. Clearly, this is an archival project. It's a reconstruction of something 30 years ago, uh, of course, uh, in response to the invitation of, of Gianni, uh, uh, the creators of this exhibition. So we have to see it this way. At the same time, I really count on generosity and imagination of the public, uh, who hopefully, you, that is, might bring a meaning to it and see it in contemporary context. If this project serves this function, you make use of it, uh, then of course it's your success. If it doesn't, it's my failure. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always a treat to hear artists speak about their work and to have the right slides at the same moment, something that is very difficult to accomplish during discussion. But I think it's a very good base now to start discussion. I want to start with a couple of questions for you, Kate. I think uh, the, the brand Guerrilla Girls is so much fun that sometimes maybe people oversee how incredibly well it is designed and how incredibly thoughtful and detail obsessed actually it was created. And I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, more if you could tell us more about like the name, how you gave the name, what, what the connotations are in the name. Then also the whole affiliation to the feministic tradition and what made you different, basically. And then also the whole stylistical uh, element and the whole, maybe you want to speak about branding, but I'd, I'd say now branding, the whole branding element of Guerrilla Girls. So the name really just came about by chance at this first meeting. You know, we had the idea to do posters, and we were a small group, you know, figuring things out. And um, someone suggested Gorilla Girls, and we really liked it because of the alliteration. We want, at that point, this was before girl power and all that kind of stuff. We wanted to show that we were different. Maybe that's a kind of branding element, although we certainly weren't thinking about that at the moment. Um, Girl, you weren't supposed to call yourself a girl. Women, women had fought really hard um, in the uh, feminist movement of the 70s to be called women. You can't call a grown woman a girl. So we decided, you know, one way to show we were different was to use the word girls. And then we were trying to think of, you know, what would go with it. And we came up with Gorilla, the freedom fighter. And it wasn't until much later, maybe almost a year later, that we started wearing the masks. 
you can see some early pictures of us wearing like uh, balaclavas and paper bags and you know things like that. But at one meeting, one of our really bad spellers, you know, those artists are often really bad spellers, was spelling Gorilla Girls and spelled Gorilla like the animal. And it was like the skies parted and we said, let's get us some gorilla masks. And here we are, all these years later, still stuck in these things. <laughs> Maybe to add the element of the artist's name, I mean, all these late kind of forgotten artists or all these female artists, most of them uh, from the pre-war era that had very little chances to make a career that was similar to their male colleague. And I mean, you picked, I don't know if you picked the name Kate Kolwitz yes. or if somebody gave it to you? Yeah, no, we all pick our names, and in the beginning, people did research, you know, you either had an artist who you absolutely loved, like we have a, an early member, Alma Thomas, um, or you were kind of, or Frida Kahlo, or you were looking for someone and, and rediscovering someone, so we had Elizabeth uh, B. Gay Lebrun, you know, who wasn't really, to, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi. I picked Kata Kolwitz because she was an activist as well as an artist, and that's what I consider myself. So it wasn't necessarily that it was my favorite work in the whole world, but it was her philosophy and her attitude. She didn't just do expensive art. She always did cheap prints. Well, she, um, she was a German artist who lived from the mid um, 19th century to the mid 20th century and did a lot of political work about all kinds of issues. I think it's it's quite uh, quite well done, you know. So that phonetically, gorilla is so close to guerrilla, that works quite well together. And that this uh, this artist names like Kate Kolwitz create also kind of a human element to uh, beyond the gorilla mask and and put it down in a certain way. But I think it's really interesting because you were part of those protests in front of MoMA, and those protests, like so many other protests. They didn't really have an, an immediate result. Actually, I, I guess people got tired eventually and stopped protesting, and that was it. And I think it was, it was really a big difference. You were uh, not the first feminist group uh, to, to demonstrate or like, to be against the inequality in the art world for male and female artists, but you were the first to react with a design poster, with a name, with a slogan, the conscience of the art world. That's how you signed this early poster, Guerrilla Girls, the conscience of the art world. And with a very concise communication strategy because you reduced your message to sheer facts. Can you tell us a little bit more about this economy of the message and of the information? Well, I wouldn't call it reduced to sheer facts. I, facts, I would call it creative use of information. <laughs> Yes, we really had this idea to say something simple, and if you took time to read it, you know, you would never, you, you couldn't think about things the same way again. And obviously, we don't always succeed in that. But a perfect example of that is our most well known poster Do Women Have to Be Naked to Get into the Metropolitan Museum? Well, we could have just, we wanted to do a poster about how few women were on the walls of major museums. So we could have done a poster that said, there aren't enough women artists in the Metropolitan Museum. And if we did that poster, I would not be sitting here today. I read somewhere mm -hmm. that actually those first posters weren't meant as art, but that it was more kind of an activist intervention. But within two years, you had invitations, and you did that show at the Clock Tower Gallery, where you openly criticized the Whitney Biennial, and uh, where you also started to get into, into racial discrimination. I think uh, one of the slides was, uh, was called Well Hung at the Whitney <laughs> to criticize the male dominance. Another one was called The Colorblind Test, where you showed actually that there was kind of a, almost a, a racial profile of the artists who were represented in the Whitney Biennial. But how was that in the beginning? Like, did you, did you think at all about uh, being an activist or an artist? Did that matter? Yeah, um, well, I can't talk for, for everybody um, in the group, but we, 
have always been a bunch of artists who have a very, very wide notion of what art is. However, we definitely were not considering this art when we started out. It was activism. We wanted to you know, bang people over the heads and shake them and name names and um, change uh, the art world. And then very quickly, you know, the uh, other parts of politics and, and culture, which you can see looking around us today in Washington, we've done a great job of that. Um, but yeah, so we didn't think of it at all. And then I remember, I can't remember the exact year, but MoMA had a show of political art, and they didn't put us in it because they said it wasn't art. And I think that's what changed a lot of people's minds. It was like, fuck that. You know, of course it's political. You know, it's art, it's political. So I think, I know my thinking about it changed. I wasn't interested in, in having this be art, but I now see that it actually is, even though we're a collective group and so many people contribute, it really is the work of one artist. When you look at this 33, you know, we work as, as one artist. I know we're not one artist, but it, it is a body of work, and it definitely is art, and it definitely is activism. Christoph, you showed us the two works that are in the show and contextualized them within your larger oeuvre. I mean, for both works, public space plays a very important role. And from the very beginning, you had a, a, a very high interest in public space and interestingly also in vehicles. I mean, we've seen a couple of them which are, are really beautiful, also have a humorous element, humorous side to them, but also a, a political impact discussing uh, also the, the role of the citizen and the speech, basically free speech in public space. Can you tell us a little bit more about your beginnings, like about those vehicles and how you performed them partly yourself in Poland and later in Europe? Well, <clears throat> in Poland, under the previous regime, um, you couldn't imagine uh, uh, easily to develop projects like homeless vehicle. So that, those projects were more metaphorical machines that were uh, trying to find form uh, for the absurdity of the situation in which uh, the so-called individual uh, citizen uh, had to live. Uh, so there was this particular vehicle was developed in the context of, of this uh, uh, fetishism of progress. Uh, the communist authorities were, in fact, running this one big constructivist machine. They were the constructivist artists. You know, we citizens, so-called citizens, were just uh, elements of that machine. They were running this futurist uh, enterprise. So uh, here, no matter whether, like the idea of intellectual, for example, was you should just uh, walk back and forth and think and develop this intellectual uh, discourse. And uh, as long as he or she doesn't descend to the ground, doesn't touch the ground, uh, doesn't really actually connect with people, then the machine will, uh, will work. The progress is guaranteed. One linear movement, only in one direction, towards better future. You know, so this absurdity of this freedom of artists and intellectuals in this world design machine apparatus uh, filled with these slogans about uh, highway towards a better future and whatever mechanical language. Well, that's what's the condition. Of course, next to my vehicle, there was another vehicle very slowly moving because vehicle moved in a walking speed back and forth, always ahead, was the police vehicle, just watching. And the people were passing by, pretending they don't see anything, just in case. There are other of those early vehicles that uh, the movement is activated by the flow of communication between the people placed actually on the vehicles. There were other versions like, yes. So basically, the more these people would talk to each other, 
the faster the vehicle would, yes. would circulate oh, yeah. in public There were space. a whole series, I don't have time to show it. But anyway, I was into those vehicles. And then finally, when I arrived to uh, New York with 100,000 homeless people also, employ themselves employed in pushing those vehicles my uh, kind of design uh, whatever the design uh, uh, training I had and all of those other vehicles started to circulate in my vein and then I come up with vehicle for uh, this situation so different here the person was not a metaphor it was actually an agent someone who could push, do things, speak, perform, instruct, discuss using this vehicle. I would like to hear a little bit more about the, the communication around the homeless vehicle. So it's, it's interesting to see this object, this well-designed object that seemed to have worked. I mean, you also uh, cooperated closely with homeless people to make the vehicle even better and so to make sure that they are happy with, with the, the simple infrastructure that it offers, basically this channel to sleep in, uh, the basin to wash yourself with, and, and the basket to collect mm -hmm. cans. But I mean, nevertheless, when I looked at the homeless vehicle, I, I really understood that it wasn't really the artwork that it wasn't like this object, basically these well-designed objects, and that you are not a designer. I mean, you use your skills and your knowledge and your talent for design, obviously, but to create something, uh, and actually it's a prop for communication, I would say. Would you agree with this interpretation, and how do you see the overall communication concept around the homeless vehicle? Yes, it's, it's to communicate uh, absurdity and impossibility of this machine. So, uh, first of all, to create situations so people will take it seriously as yet another consumer product that may be useful for them because it's presented in public. So, well, eventually, by discussing the matter with the operator, performer, he gives all the instructions, homeless person becomes clear, it's not for me. It's only for that person. Then it's become also clear that this is not the way to live. This is an emergency equipment. So its function is, its utopia is based on that its function will make it obsolete. No? So, so more of those vehicles will create more consciousness that this is not a solution. If you have an emergency unit in the hospital, you know, and the people come with wounds, uh, of course, there is a bandage uh, they can apply. So the idea was to create the kind of bandage that would start speaking of the very conditions under which the wound occur mm -hmm. in hope that there will be no more need for this bandage, no more wounds to heal. Uh, so uh, that's a complicated process. Uh, the, the, the vehicle is supposed to be uh, multiplied and also designed and produced, uh, altered, completely transformed by homeless people themselves in a special workshop. Uh, didn't happen for various reasons, because of action of police that destroyed the homeless uh, uh, cultural center that was about to be formed next around the Tompkins Square Park. But instead, to my surprise, the vehicle became uh, not produced, but reproduced by media. It be, it, uh, all kinds of media, uh, said the kind of liberal, the left, and also the very conservative, they really, and television, uh, everybody started to talk about this vehicle. So, and, and then through this vehicle, many people were speaking among themselves, like in, in Philadelphia on television, they were talking about the, their own life and so forth. So the vehicle... So actually the homeless became also newsworthy, right. but with positive, a positive message yes. at its core. So in that sense, it functioned pretty yeah. well. We should move on quickly to the projection work. And I mean, obviously, you started very early to use these strong Xenon Arco projectors to project on building. You spoke about the buildings that you were projected, uh, that you would project on as prosthetic architecture. It would be interesting to hear more about 
the Hirsch horn as a piece of prosthetic for your work, and also mm -hmm. like how much you were influenced by the brutalist architecture. I mean, it's quite unique to have a building that has only one window to the outside world. <laughs> you know, <coughs> Ministry of Love in Orwell uh, writing didn't have any windows. <laughs> So, so, of course, the brutalist architecture, mm. willingly or not, re yes, re don't get me wrong, I, I love Gordon Bunshaft and I'm a big admirer of his building, but still it's quite an extreme architectural formula. Mm -hmm. And But maybe s tell us a little bit more about the variety of building. I mean, you projected on a, on a, on a windowless building in Tribeca, you, you project on, on historical buildings, on monuments that you reactivated through these slide projectors and through these static images in the beginning. It's kind of uh, um, interesting that you use very often images of hands. And I think in the most cases, hands that you appropriated from media imagery. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sources of those images? Well, <clears throat> I found a very interesting relation between media imagery and architectural forms, the bodily forms, because of neoclassicism, uh, which carries on its tradition even in this building, uh, the symmetry, uh, it's all uh, somehow related to body, human body, at least in neoclassic tradition. Uh, buildings are wrestling with their own bodily metaphors. Uh, especially uh, and at night, of course, they are uh, kind of relieving their function during the day. Uh, there's a kind of nightmarish situation where they, you see some uh, uh, people cleaning those buildings, maintaining them at night. Uh, the, the building has some other life at night. So that, it's important that those projections take place at night when the buildings are asleep and they're having their own nightmares. You know. <laughs> so to re any projection at night actually is a kind of uh, a form. Uh, that was, uh, also our relation to the building during the day and during the night is interesting. Uh, there is a process of uh, architecturalization of our bodies and bodification of architecture. We are a kind of uh, uh, merging or interacting and uh, with the facades, but we're working with, uh, walking with, uh, working in those buildings. We actually are uh, absorbing their discipline and their organ organized bodily uh, existence. We are us. Uh, precise as we identify with them. So they are uh, clearly anything, the projection on this building takes place before my projections. So this is like a second degree of projection. So I invoke. Of course, the beginning of this type of work in 1981. Uh, was in, in Canada, in Nova Scotia, where I projected using Kodak carousel projectors, those images of hands, and I was not sure about this, whether it makes sense. And uh, But it was in the middle of the night, it was empty, and I started to hear some uh, sound, people, and I realized that people standing there were laughing. They were laughing. Uh, so, that, so that really encouraged me. It means that there was something that they found in those buildings, comical. It's about them, themselves, you know, as facades, as buildings. But they started probably about a little bit, they laughed about themselves, you know. They, they right. found these projections telling some existential truth. <laughs> I prepared some questions to both of you. I mean, obviously, for both of you, media played a very important role, media and TV. It would be interesting to know more about the function of this media, media as an amplifier in your work and as a player that, that you take advantage of, and also the risks, basically, where you can also lose control, maybe, of the message or of, of the artwork or of all aspects of the artwork because it, it turns into a mediatic message that sets another tone and is also uh, emitted through another channel. Maybe Kate, would you want to start? 
Okay, well, you know, from the minute we started putting up those first posters, we got all these requests for interviews. And I'll just say one interesting thing about TV. And t we're never on TV in the US, almost never. I mean, we did do Stephen Colbert, which was kind of bizarre a couple of years ago, but um, they're afraid of masked women on TV. But in Europe, bring it, they're happy, you know, they love it. Brazil, happy, you know, um, they, they'll just put anything on TV. And of course, you have to get your message across in sound bites, and they, they cut in the work. And we do consider it a part of our practice because we've always wanted to get our message out to as many people as possible because we feel that even if you don't care about art or um, you know, film industry or whatever we're, we're talking about, it, gives, it, give, it kind of empowers people to, st to who want to and are already doing their own stuff. So that, and, and we love that. We meet so many people all over the world. Um, whether media controls us or, or we control media, I don't know. I mean, we can't really control it. It's good publicity because they'll show some of the work and then we'll get letters and people will you know, do things. But mostly it's the same questions over and over again that aren't all that interesting. And our current members find ourselves in a situation where we try to say to each other before an interview, let's try to do this differently. Because you know the questions are almost always going to be the same. But you want to try to really communicate. And we're so, we've done this, you know, we're, um, even our new members are so good at, you know, uh, spouting the jargon. The real, the real problem with media for us, I think, is to can you say more what? about the jargon? That's interesting. Like, well, how, what is the well? Maybe ABC that goes to branding too. You know, over time we and and we keep doing it. I mean, some of the language you saw here is is you know a year old, six months old. But we develop these kind of iconic ways to talk about something, and then we kind of hammer it to death in a way. You know, we we say it, we show it, we do videos about it. You know. Um, posters, street posters, huge banners. And that's our work, and that's, that's really the important thing about what we do. But the noise around our you know, anonymous identity and the performative aspect of us just showing up somewhere um, gets us a lot of attention, but is it always the attention that, that you want? Christoph, what about your experience with using the media as a, as a channel in to bring many, out your message. In many ways, similar to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, when it comes to public space, which doesn't make sense if we don't open it up and don't use it, don't make it accessible to people of whom no one wants to hear, or issues that no one wants to discuss. If we cannot insert those things in the public space, there is basically no public space. It becomes private space of some people who are using it for their own propaganda, for their own uh, publicity, uh, commercial or, uh, or other kind of publicity, political. So that means that if we want to speak ourselves, to the issues that nobody wants to hear, <laughs> or we want to engage people in speaking through this public space, communicating things that they went through, they lived through, uh, we have to be uh, kind of experts here on media. Uh, without media, that's not possible. Those people have no access to media. We have no access to media. We should actually be media artists. There is not much choice here. When it comes to uh, architecture and the appropriation of existing powerful uh, for symbolic forms of sculptures and monuments, that's a possibility of the temple through performances and media installations. We actually animate and force those uh, very important uh, uh, symbolic environment to, uh, to assume a new role and to speak, uh, to become a medium for speech of people. Uh, that 
That's what I do. Of course, uh, when you look at the history of uh, avant-garde art that, uh, that really uh, wanted to uh, make change, provide, create conditions for social and political change, there were uh, avant-garde artists were using media like uh, John Hartfield, for example. And John Hartfield or Hannah Ho uh, are people of, of that uh, affected kind of political Dada uh, crowd. And they are like teachers of, uh, of, of myself. I, I learned from those people uh, how to do my projections, how to actually animate a, a public space in terms of, of course, uh, vehicles and uh, instruments. Uh, I could also bring uh, artists from constructivist, productivist period mm -hmm. who also introduced this kind of media and design. Uh, and they understood that's the way artists should go in, if they want to be part of changing society and change things. Mm -hmm. Like over 30 years ago when you started your activities in, in public space, both of you, there, were no, there was no internet, or it was just in the beginnings at the end of the 1980s. There were no social media. I mean, nowadays, social media, for example, Instagram seems to be an incredible projection field into the social tissue of society. Do you use social media? Do you have Instagram accounts? And what, maybe as very last question, what is your advice to a younger generation of artists? You are kind of role models for these young activist artists nowadays. Like even, we are not surprised. It's kind of interesting, this group that was founded on October 30th, 2017, against sexual harassment they took over the slogan of Jenny Holzer. So actually there are even in the work of this young activist a reference to the 1980s. And uh, these people seem to, to really accept this generation of 80s artists who were activists uh, and artists as a role model. But what is your advice for these coming generations and what is your position towards social media? Well, we use social media a lot. I mean, we're busy doing projects all the time, so maybe not as much as we should, but it's been an incredible way for us to communicate with people, and um, it's fantastic. I mean, when you think about it, back to these first posters, you know, it seems like a big deal now, but we posted them up ourselves. We probably put up like 100, and an hour later in New York, someone had slapped something over them. So today, things live on forever. And as to you know, young artists, young activists, which we travel the world talking to people, meeting with people, doing workshops with them, I would say they don't need to learn anything from the Guerrilla Girls. They are doing it. It's an incredible time for activism. Uh, the world of artists is great. The um, online world of people doing these amazingly creative activist projects. Um, and, and all kinds of art is amazing. Um, I think they're doing an incredible job. Well, <clears throat> some of those young colleagues of mine, very much younger <laughs> than me, they think that um, I was a, a, a founder of projection mapping. <laughs> this is, uh, strange, because I didn't think about it, uh, such uh, term, didn't cross my mind. So basically, I'm learning from those people uh, how to catch up, catch up with this kind of label and uh, maybe uh, still try to be of some, uh, some use or advice. But in fact, I have no advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a wonderful end because it's <laughs> the trigger for more and hopefully for discussions. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank Katya Kovitz and Christoph Vodichko to be part of the show Brand New and uh, to, to speak about their work and to open up many aspects of a work that is incredibly rich and interesting. It was an honor to work with you on this show, and I want to thank you. I want to thank you as a public to have come and to have listened to us. And I think we're still around, so maybe if you have questions, just step up, and we will try to answer them. Thank you so much. <laughs>